Guys, welcome to What's Barking Local. It's Jerry Miller. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you on the I Love Seaville Network. What's Barking Local, of course, the program that puts animals across Charlottesville, Almoral County, and Central Virginia in a positive spotlight. Yeah, we dogs. feature influencers. <laughs> we feature veterinarians, entrepreneurs, <laughs> nonprofits, and charities, folks that are doing things right for our community. And Harris Tolber, our director, let's go to the studio cam. And we'll welcome the brains of the operation, Patty Bowden, to the set. Jerry Miller, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> you look great. Ooh, thanks. Happy uh, uh, day after, what, Fat Tuesday? Day after Mardi Gras. We lived. Ash We're lived. We're in Lent now. <laughs> <laughs> we have on set Dr. Chuck Wood, and I'll do a yeah. little introduction and then uh, get you on board in the conversation. Yeah. This gentleman, an entrepreneur. This gentleman, the owner of Old Dominion Animal Hospital. Mm -hmm. This gentleman, also like us, a conscious capitalist or a social entrepreneur, um, mm -hmm. in that he's the founder of the Companion Animal Fund, um, certainly committed to giving back to Central Virginia and making it better than when he first arrived, which is the absolute mission of what we stand for at I Love Seville and right. Animal Connection. Mm -hmm. um, so I will ask him a question, then you jump in here. Absolutely. Talk to us, Dr. Chuck Wood, of who you are, the man, the family man, the entrepreneur, the benefactor, your passions, your interests, the show is yours, sir. Why, this is fantastic. I've been waiting my whole <laughs> life to have a, to have a captive audience. All right. <laughs> so um, I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia, went to University of Georgia, graduated uh, in 81, came back to Charlottesville, or came to Charlottesville. My wife said she always wanted to live in the mountains and opened Old Dominion Animal Hospital. It was in McIntyre Plaza for seven years and opened a building on Preston Avenue. Um, I'm an avid sailor, so my second love is sailing. And we have animals, and then my son is a veterinarian, and my daughter, Meredith, is, uh, is a hospital uh, manager. So we're an integral part of the community. My wife is a, is a, owns the Nook on the downtown mall. Yay. Used to own Rhodes Farm Inn down mm -hmm. out in Nelson County, so we're, we're a, a busy bunch of people in, enjoying life. Nice. Well, the reason, uh, one of the reasons Dr. Wood is here is uh, he's made a difference many, 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 many years ago uh, in his practice. One of his uh, holistic vets helped me with my dog who had cancer, and we got great results. And also the Companion Animal Fund is a very important organization around here. It helps uh, large and small rescues of all kinds. You know, some of these little guys, they... They don't get enough financial help, and the Companion Animal Fund is here to, to help them get what they need. And I love what the mm -hmm. Companion Animal Fund stands, what it stands for, and we'll throw it to you here, Dr. Wood. Right. You mm -hmm. have um, built a reputation and a following um, as the owner of Old Dominion Animal Hospital. Well, for years, you have helped, um, you know, husbands, wives, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, friends, take yeah. care thousands. of their thousands, take care of their furry friends. I have two German Shepherds myself. My German Shepherds are an integral part, as part you, of the family. That you said, as a family. Right. Um, I, I love them dearly. They have supported us through good times, through bad times, just incredible aspect and you know, welcome part of our family here. Where I'm going with this is when you're able to build relations, relationships like that with people, you're able to potentially leverage those relationships for the better of the community. And mm -hmm. one example of that is the Companion Animal Fund, where you've built the foundation through your veterinarian practice to then mm -hmm. use that as an extension as a social entrepreneur to make the community better. Please put that in perspective for us. The reason that we originally started the Companion Animal Fund was I kept seeing all these animals coming in that were being adopted out by rescue groups. And mm -hmm. the rescue groups were going to the SPCA, which had become a non-kill shelter, which is a great thing. But then they, they were running out of room, so they were being adopted out or going directly to these, these, uh, these shelters. And the shelters spent all their time trying to find homes for animals, and they didn't have any way to raise money and do anything with them. So every weekend, if you were at Lowe's or at uh, pet places right. or Animal Connection and had animals outside, they were part of these groups, but they didn't have ways to raise money and things. So we decided, well, it doesn't really make any sense. These, all these animals need treatment and things. So we decided to start a fund. It's 100%, <coughs> you know, it's a nonprofit uh, 501c3. And by doing this, we were able to 
get money donated and therefore spay neuter animals, neuter animals, mm -hmm. help buy food for animals in emergency situations when there's been um, animals that have been uh, rescued, we're able to, to jump in and, and add money to that. The horses recently up in, in mm -hmm. Orange County, that was a, it was a big disaster, we were able to donate money for that. So we we're fortunate the community is a very giving community. Let's turn that into a sizzle reel, Harris Tolber. We're going to create highlights from the interview that we will then send to Patty Bowden. Mm -hmm. um, I love the concept because the social entrepreneur piece that he's talking about, the conscious capitalist that he is, is undoubtedly what you embody as mm -hmm. the owner of Animal Connection. I see why you welcomed him. Absolutely. What inspires you um, about the Companion Animal Fund and what Dr. Wood is doing? Well, if anything else, I mean, it's just the, the idea of your animals as your companion and your family friend. I really dislike pet owner. I mean, these animals, they don't, they might choose you, they might not choose you, but you know, they really don't have that much of a choice when you, when you bring them in. So inviting an animal to be into your home, to me, sounds so much nicer than you know, a pet owner. I mean, you're inviting them into your home to be part of your family and companion animal really just says what that's about. And, uh, you know, they are their, your companions, they're your companions for life. Um, they, the rescue pets are looking for companions. They don't want just to be, you know, another appendage to the family. They, they you know, they want to be part of the group. So, to, you know, to provide services to make that happen is just really important, I think. What I love about what both you guys are doing and the entire influence, the impetus, the inspiration behind what we're doing with the I Love Seville show and the I Love Seville network was, you know, I was here on August 12th right there own 40% uh, of this building here, have 23 tenants in this building, and from a skin in the game standpoint, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I want to protect the investment, yes. okay? Right. Yep. Also, mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh my goodness, my business is tied, it's called I Love Seville. Mm -hmm. I obviously love this community inside and out, and most importantly, um, you know, my family, my kids. I wanted to be able to, when they got to history class, whether it's AP US history, whether it's middle school history, to relay son, daughter, I have a son named Trey, I was there, I saw it firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, this is the perspective that I can tell you that might not be in the history textbooks. Mm -hmm. Where I'm going with this, Dr. Wood, is I, I, I love to celebrate entrepreneurs, influencers, and people that are doing positivity for the community, like Patty Bowden, like yourself. I would like for you to take an opportunity to kind of tell the birth story of um, Old Dominion Animal Hospital, um, the trials, the tribulations, the successes, the struggles, <laughs> um, the, the kind of stories that when people hear it, they are inspired as well. Maybe they're on the fence about launching their business. Even if it's not in the animal category, we all can learn from each other. For sure. Well, I, as I said, I graduated from vet school in 81, came to Charlottesville, worked at another hospital for about nine months, opened my own practice in a, in a little shopping center, McIntyre Plaza. Little McIntyre Plaza. Yeah. Gosh. And at the time, it, was a, it had been a, um, a, uh, a, play, a laundry place. And it was just four walls and, and a ceiling and a floor. And mm -hmm. the, the, the landlord said, well, you know, I'll renovate it for you. I paid uh, $582 a month to rent the place, renovate the whole thing, and started there just myself and one technician, just the two of us. And that was it for about four or five months. And all the other vets in Charlottesville said, well, you really can't be on that side of town. We're all in Albemarle County because there's not going to be any business in the city of Charlottesville. Mm. So how can you, you know, get business there? And I said, well, they got to come by me to get to you was my philosophy. Opportunity. So opportunity was there. So I, I opened the place, and sure enough, on day one, people started coming over. We started doing extremely well. The third person I hired was my wife. She was working in the university, and she came, and I ended up being my receptionist and my bookkeeper and the whole thing. And then we just kept going on and on, and now we have four veterinarians and three technicians and multiple other people and do all kinds of things. In terms of interesting things, one of the things that, that you find is that you live longer because you have pets. Absolutely. And people don't think a lot about it, but I see it on a daily basis that these, these people come in, and especially elderly people, mm -hmm. and unfortunately I'm in that category myself Oh, now. come on now. Uh, ah, come on. But people come in and they basically, their pet is, has now aged and it's 14 or 15 years old. 
and they feel really bad about the fact that you know it's time to make decisions and it's not the decisions they really want to make but they make the decision and then the next thing they say I say to them is you know you really ought to get another pet and they say oh no the last two years has been bad and of course just like us our, most of our ill health happens as we get older but I said, you know, you'll live longer if you do that. Your blood pressure will be lower in the whole thing. Oh, no, I'm not getting another pet. I said, well, when it's time, you just call me. We'll find one. Sure enough, six months later, mm -hmm. I see the same person walking on the downtown mall. They're all crippled. They're having difficulty walking. Oh, They've mm -hmm. aged dramatically. And I walk up to them and I say, you've got to get a pet. And so finally, I get them a pet. And this is, a, this is a client we had for years and years. I send her the pet, and sure enough, a month later, she's walking down the downtown mall again, spry, just like she's a teenager. Because you're quiet, you have to get out. <laughs> you've got to walk that dog, and, you've got to, and you have a companion there. She had lost her husband years ago, oh. and all of a sudden, she had, she had no pet, she had no family member, and nobody to make her go outside. It's a reason to get up and out of bed. And Patty, you jump in here in the conversation. Ooh, I'm going to okay. piggyback it when, from what I've seen with my family, um, with, my, uh, with my grandmother, as soon as she retired from work, the reason to get up in the morning was gone. Was gone. Yes. And then when the reason to get up in the morning was gone, you then, because of that reason, you, you disregard or you ignore or you don't emphasize or prioritize perhaps the pain you're feeling as much because you have to get to work. Right. And then when that reason to, to get up and get out of bed is gone, then next thing you know, it's magnified. And it's the, the magnitude is order many order times greater. Yes. And it's a perfect example with what you're saying with pets um, and something you undoubtedly have seen, Patty Bowden, at your store, Animal Connection. Oh, and I, and I see it. My boyfriend's mother has seven cats and four dogs. And she makes, she makes her food for them every day. I wow. mean, from scratch every day so, and they've got a schedule and she's got a schedule and she she's excited about the day I mean she you know these they're very entertaining all these little personalities that are around except for the one called Zippy that attacks you so <laughs> and she's the oldest so the oldest of the cats but, um, and let me but throw, it's fun let me throw this to you so three German Shepherds previously or excuse me two German Shepherds previously had three German Shepherds yep. she knows the mm -hmm. story um, about mm -hmm. three okay. four weeks ago I had to put one down oh, um, sorry. so two purebreds and one of them that was a shepherd chow the shepherd chow lived to almost 17 She's the one that I put down. I saw firsthand and how my purebreds, while they towered in size over her, she was always the alpha because they came into the house as puppies. And she was the adult dog constantly bullying them. Mm -hmm. And while they grew up in size, it became 105 pounds and 125 pounds respectively. Right. They still had the mindset that Lucy, um, the 55 pound Chow German Shepherd, <laughs> was the alpha was dog. The alpha dog. Right. right. Okay, yes. so they never messed with her. Yes. Um, <coughs> as she got older and geriatric, mm -hmm. and um, as she got arthritic, and as her back legs were given away, they were constantly coming up, messing with her, getting her up, getting mm -hmm. her to walk around, yep. getting her to extend her legs instead of being in a little ball, which would have probably shortened her life much faster. Definitely. Um, I was just truly amazed, and I'm gonna throw it to you, I was truly amazed of how the boys, Max and Leo, understood that L Lucy, my mixed breed, uh, was on the back end of her life and how they had to offer her support to improve her quality of life. Yes. Well, and the big difference is that they are, they're group oriented, they're pack oriented, mm -hmm. and because they're pack oriented, there's an alpha dog, and the alpha dog is always the alpha dog. And whereas the three of us could be sitting here and, you know, w w being human beings, we feel sorry for someone who is poor or whatever, but the alpha dogs and the, the relationship of dogs in a pack situation always stays the same, and you always have to make sure it stays the same. And as a result of that, they basically take care of, nurture, and, and things like that, the alpha dog. Um, the order of the pack. The order of the pack, exactly. So as long as you, as long as you do that, and, that, and that's one of the things that you get into trouble with, is if you have two dogs at home, and you love them both, and maybe they're even from the same litter, one is an alpha dog, one is a beta dog. You can tell which is which a lot of times very easily, but what happens with human nature is the poor beta dog comes running to you, the alpha dog growls at him, and what do you do? You immediately uh. <laughs> yell at the alpha dog. Well, uh -oh. you are trying to mess up the packs. So the alpha dog says, that's not allowed. The beta dog says, what's well, now two on one? So I'm gonna stand up against the alpha dog. So then they all, I get to see them all the time because they, they get in fights. So you know what you're supposed to do? When the alpha dog basically growls at the beta dog, you're supposed to go to the beta dog and say, no bad dog. 
It sounds very weird. For humans. But for makes humans. sense for the wolf pack. Right. And, and, the, and the, beta dog, the beta dog knows what's going on. He understands. And you can go ahead and give him a treat later on. You can, you can do human things to make him correspond and realize that you still love him. But if you do that, then you'll keep him where he's supposed to be because there's an alpha and a beta. They're, they're not human beings. And then everything will be fine. On the other hand, if you don't, I get to see you more because you're going to get in fights all the time because you're basically correcting or trying to alter normal group behavior, normal animal behavior. That's fascinating. That's, that's interesting. I mean, we've been having conversations about pack or herd behavior. And um, I mean, with horses, it's the horses that have the most training or education, if you will, they're the ones that are usually in charge of the herd. And last night at Mardi Gras, we had a really interesting conversation about chickens. And someone was having problems with a rooster and then all, all the, the other chickens. And she was giving us a story last night. Hello, Susan Benchoff, if you're there. She was telling us that she had to hold this rooster like this and stroke it. And the other chickens would see that she was in charge of the rooster and they would, now Susan's in charge of the pack because she's, she's holding this rooster. I had never heard such a thing, but I mean, I just, think, I just find all this pack herd gaggle what, whatever you've got uh, behavior very interesting I to, love to it. learn about and, and I love it as like um, <clears throat> someone in school who very much got deep into sociology and anthropology <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I love how the study of people and culture undoubtedly applies to the study of animals um, and you over your time at Old Dominion Animal Hospital have seen it firsthand um, and it, it you know it's something that like you have to educate the uh, the patient or educate the client the human mm -hmm. yep. because it's so different from human nature it is um, talk gotta, to me about that well you've got to ignore human nature because <laughs> if you if you use human nature on animals then you get into trouble because as I said they are pack oriented they're always pack oriented mm -hmm. now cats are different cats are there's number one cat there's number two cat and then there's number 99 cat so they're not the same. So they basically, number one will pick on number two, and then everybody picks on everybody down the line, but they don't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But dogs, dogs are simple. If you've got 10 dogs, there's an alpha, beta, an epsilon, all, all the way on down the whole thing. So as a result of that, you have to pay attention to that. And as long as you do, it's fine. But you have to throw out human nature. Mm -hmm. You basically, the poor little dog who's coming up to you and the big dog's growling at him, well, the, the poor little dog is, is not the alpha dog. And you have to say, I'm sorry, push him aside, give him a little treat when the other dog's not looking, then everything will be fine. I love this stuff. Tell yes. us the crazy, and then neat. you jump in here, here. I, <laughs> I, I love this. Tell me the, the <laughs> most unique or uh, most memorable story when it comes to dogs that you can remember from your practice. Oh, wow. Whoa. Well, a, a lot of the, the things that I remember the most are the, are the times when I've done things wrong. Uh -oh. And those are, those are things when, when I, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Learning uh, opportunities. Learning opportunities. Yes. When I was in McIntyre Plaza hmm. years ago, I came in on a day that I happened to be off. And uh, the technician said, Mrs. Smith, who has two Great Danes and owned a restaurant down in Charlottesville, um, want, needs a bag of dog food. And she had this little hatchback. So I went and opened the patch back up and put the bag of dog food in there. So um, the technician came up to me and said, well, unfortunately, it's the wrong bag of food. So I got the bag of food out. By then, the two dogs were in the car. The two Great Danes were in the car. And so I opened the hatchback and leaned in to put the thing. So I was entering their territory at the time. Uh -oh. <laughs> and so the dog went, Orf! and I knew he'd had my eyeball in his, his mouth. He really did. And he just had, he just oh had bit my face and it was bleeding the whole thing. So it's, it's a learning thing. You, you learn, then again, don't enter their territory when wow. they owned it. At the time, you know, there wasn't anything in there. It was perfectly fine. So there's been, there's been multiple episodes about, about that. A lot of the, the interesting things, I also do exotics. So I do birds and gerbils and hamsters and snakes and things. So there's a lot of really interesting wow. <laughs> things like, you know, somebody brings in a box, they brought in a box and we put it on the scale one day and it weighed 75 pounds and we open the box and here's this big 10 foot uh, python Get out. that's in there. So it's, it was interesting working on those. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, later that day, we had this very um, uh, elegant professor from UVA, this nice woman who brought in her rats that were pets. Rats are incredibly intelligent animals. Um, dated a girl one time in my past, and she had a daughter. And her daughter had um, two pet rats. These rats knew their names. 
these rats would come on command and it sounds from a society standpoint is this wow. is a disgusting pet to have the reality <laughs> is rats make great pets for little children because they're much more durable than say a hamster or a gerbil yes. when they are handled by kids kids don't know their pressure points and how rough they can be and often can hurt the point. gerbils yes. or the hamsters where the rat is not going to feel the same kind of pain yeah Ger yeah gerbils are not as user friendly they're not as a pet and, and my kids that's all they wanted to have was gerbils I said get a guinea pig get a rat something like that and they would they were they're easier for kids sure but we ended up with gerbils what kind of pets did you have when you were little well that's one of the reasons I'm a veterinarian ah. is because as I grew up I, I my, my 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 first memory of having animals is when I was like three or four years old and our neighbor had given us a kitten and the kitten um, my mom said I don't like cats I don't like cat boxes the whole thing so the cat has to stay outside and the next day it was dead in the road. Oh. So that, that's what kind of, and then the, my, my rest of my life, my mom always said, well, you can't, we, we'd have one dog and that was it. And, you know, the dog had to stay outside and the whole thing. So I felt sorry for animals. If she would have let me have all these pets and things, you know. You might not be a vet. I might be a human doctor, which is what my classmates that didn't get into vet school, that's what they're doing now. How does huh. a, how does um, a vet, um, so vets, I think, um, you know, the, the stereotype is vets work on dogs and cats. How does a vet get into exotic animals and how difficult is the transition from going to working on dogs and cats to parrots? to pythons, like you mentioned, to rodents, to iguanas. I mean, not every vet's doing that. No, they're not. And w when you go to vet school, at least when I was in vet school, you had to be competent in everything. So you had to do horses, cows, pig, sheep, goat, dog, and cat. Oh my gosh. And then you had a very little, you only had really one semester, one class of exotics. So therefore, very little exotics were, were taught to you. But if you were interested in it, you take, took all these extra classes. So Electives. Answer, electives so i took all these special classes on on birds on reptiles and things like that and they're totally different a cat is not a little dog mm. and a horse mm. is not a cow they're they're all they're, i mean 90 percent of the work on a horse is on the front leg of a horse <coughs> and so you it's, and it's actually on the elbow down because there's 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 no muscles from basically the elbow down they're, they're all ligaments and tendons and things like that so it's it's a totally different and in a cow they have they have four stomachs so they have this whole thing that you have to worry about and you know mastitis with them which is which is mammary infections and metritis uh, which is uterine infections and 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 colics for for horses and things so the oh so gosh. the point being is that they're all different so uh you see a snake and the mo most common thing with snakes is, is husbandry most common thing with exotic period is husbandry we, you can't take a exotic bird and put him in a 70 degree house and basically expect them to do well they're they're tropical birds they're, they, they they like tropical environments uh, snakes, for instance, they get, they get uh, bacterial or fungal infections in their mouth because then again, two things happen. One is it's not humid enough. Number two, it's not warm enough. And then if, if they're not ready to eat, you put something in there for them to eat and they basically will ignore it. And sometimes that thing, that mouse or rattle, will, will turn around and end up um, killing them because they, they don't kill for fun. They kill to eat and that's it. Interesting. Wow. Jump in here, Patty. I don't even know where to jump in on that one. I am deathly afraid of snakes and things that crawl and, and whatnot, but I do have some experience with cattle. I, I have helped rope and brand cattle before, but, uh, and I've helped birth a few babies here and there, you know, colts and calves and whatnot, you know. The thing that intrigued me. That, I have no idea. The thing that intrigued me with what mm -hmm. you were saying was, and I see this often, you mm -hmm. know, I was born in Florida, uh, moved to Williamsburg when I was young, um, lived in Charlottesville for most of my life here, um, is the, the folks that fall in love with a husky or a St. Bernard. And the Husky or St. Bernard, and next thing you know, you're talking about the, the right climate for yes. success oh for gosh. the animal. Yes. And next yeah. thing you know, I'm seeing the Husky, or perhaps even worse, the St. Bernard, being trotted around town. In all the hot weather. In 100 degree mm. yes. heat, mm -hmm. 104 degree heat and yeah. humidity. Yep. And the person, you know, and I'm not knocking anyone, I'm not trying to knock anyone here, but they fall in love with them because they may watch a movie like Beethoven, mm -hmm. and next oh, thing yeah. you know, they want a St. Bernard, <laughs> yes. and they're walking around in that dead heat of Virginia summer. Yes. Talk and to the, me about that. And the next thing they want to do is, oh, can you shave it down so it's really short? And then the, you've lost that ventilation factor, and it's just, oh. 
Right. It's it finding works. the right dog it for the right works. climate and the right environment. And I right. can't, I got to imagine that's a difficult conversation for you to have from time to time. Well, it is because uh, buying a dog like that is like buying a car. You yeah. basically say, well, I want to have a Honda or I want to have a Ford. I want to have a, a, a sports car. I want to have an SUV or whatever. Uh, the dog thing, you, you have to think practically. Everybody says, well, you know, it, the dog is hot, but they've got this long hair. So you and I with long hair, what do we do? We perspire. And as a result mm -hmm. of the perspiration, with evaporation, that's how we cool off. That's our internal cooling mechanism. The problem with dogs is the only place they have sweat glands is on the pads of their feet. So what do you do when you have a St. Bernard in the summertime? Well, there's two things you do. One is you don't walk them outside in the middle of the day. Yeah. So obvious, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. But and even at 5 o'clock at night in, in July and August, you can't do that. So and don't walk them on the asphalt. Don't walk them on the asphalt. Exactly. Because exactly, it, it's extremely hot. So that's the first thing. You pick your time of days that you do it first thing in the morning before you go to work, and then you do it late in the evening. But mm -hmm. the second thing is you put artificial sweat on them, which is just water. So you and I are sitting there perspiring as we're doing things. Mm -hmm. So you can literally mm -hmm. hose them down either before or afterwards or spray them with a little spray bottle just like you do a plant and artificial sweat all of this is water as they're walking around that that water's trapped in the hair it's evaporating it's cooling them off so that's their internal cooling mechanism even in a car this time of year with a window up mm -hmm. we had a dog we had a bulldog going through town on 64 uh, a few years ago and the dog basically was so excited in the car in in the car he overheated, came in, and his body temperature was like 110 degrees. Oh, my God. Just by sitting in the car, and it was probably 45 degrees outside. Mm. They brought him in. First thing we did was throw him in an ice bath and you know, give him IV fluids and got his temperature down to normal. So it's amazing wow. how their way of cooling off is panting. How inefficient is panting? It's so terribly inefficient. inefficient. Yes, yeah. exactly. You're going, <sighs> right. And so you're using all these muscles to do it, and you're trying you're to blow out hot You're working hard to cool off. Yes, exactly. But if you wet them down, either before or afterwards, then it makes a big difference in terms of keeping them cool. Fascinating. So you, so you pick things like that. You go, well, you know, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I have something to do later today. I can't do anything. I have to take my dog loves a walk. They're, they're, they're very schedule-oriented. Sure. They live for that 5 o'clock. They know when you're coming home, mm -hmm. you're going to take them for a walk. So you come inside, you spritz them with a bottle of water, and then you take them for a walk. You come back and you do it again if you need to. It makes a big difference in terms of keeping them cool and making them happy. Excellent. That's Jump in really, here. That's really neat to know. I did not know that I, about the spray bottle, but that's really neat to know. Um, and uh, it, it, there's so many things that are uh, that you can go to with breed appropriate. I mean, even what they eat. I mean, for us um, as store owners, talking about uh, what should a dog eat. Well, you know, the, most of them. Uh, there are a lot of European type dogs, and people want to feed them rice. Well, rice doesn't grow there, but barley, oats, corn, uh, lamb, you know, you, you find things what's breed appropriate. And, you know, most often you've pretty well got, a, a, got it close to right if you can do that. But she's choosing things, you know, that are part of their ethnic background. And that's also for us really important as far as dog care. We have a question from one of the viewers. This is for you, Patty. Any uh -oh. suggestions on a service dog trainers or ability trainers in Charlottesville? She has a, um, and you're going to help me with this, a Shiba Inu? Mm -hmm. Sh yep. Shiba Inu, then she's asking Inu. for uh, Inu. Thank yep. you. So dog trainers or ability trainers in Seville? Uh, ability trainers or agility trainers? Uh, maybe she has a spell. Dog trainers. Okay, dog trainers. Well, gosh, there, well, there are lots of them. I, I think the first thing you need to do is maybe find a good obedience trainer and get, it's just like basics. That's your groundwork there. And see how you do with that. And some, several of the, uh, the daycares have good trainers. SVCA has trainers. Uh, we have a listing of visual, visual trainers uh, over at Animal Connection. But learn the basics and decide who in your family is going to be in charge of that training so everything can be consistent. That's, that's another big deal. You can't have six different people in the family all giving different directions. You know, it needs to be one person in charge of that dog, and they can ask you know, they can invite the other members of the family to chime in. But, you know, get your basics down. Sit, stay, recall, look at me, you know, eyes on me. You know, get, get those basics down, and then you can investigate whether doing therapy work is, is right for you. Meg Taylor in Nelson mm. County. 
has a question for you. Meg Taylor in Nelson County says, um, thank you, Dr. Wood, uh, for coming on the show. And she also says, my dog will not leave his crate. We use the crate for housebreaking the dog, and he is now 100% housebroken, and he chooses to sleep in the crate. We leave the door open. We could say you can sleep upstairs on your pad, but he still walks into the crate. Should we worry about this? No, because their crate is their nest, their cave, their bed. And so therefore, if they like it, as long as you leave the door open, it's a comfortable place to be. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like a little bedroom for you with a little bed for you. If you <laughs> really want them out of it, take the top off the crate. A lot of times they're, they're shells, and you take the top off, and then it would be open, and they would probably be able to get out easier and the whole thing. But th if they like it, let them do it. As long as you leave the door open, it's perfectly fine to do that. That's fantastic. How about this question for you? And this is just coming from me personally. Um, I see a lot of stuff as the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, you know, being a small business owner myself, you go into a business where I think it's what, 53% of people have a pet? 53% uh, roughly have a dog? Um, so you're in a, a category or a field where more than one, and so are you, <laughs> more than one, uh, more than half the population percent, yep. has what you do. Yes. Talk to me about that right there. I mean, that is just like from an entrepreneur standpoint, the world is your oyster there. It is, and it's really interesting because I, I can't go anywhere. We're a small town, and I'm, I'm obviously uh, a, just a little fish in the town, but once I, <coughs> anywhere I go, whether it's a, a restaurant or go to a party or whatever, once they find out I'm a veterinarian, then they, they it's like a dentist they saying, can you look at my tooth right, for a right. dentist? <laughs> They, they do, which is great because they're, 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 they're always interesting things and they're things that, you know, you don't really necessarily want to go to the vet just to say, by the way, you know, like to say the, the dog won't come out of the crate. Is that okay? Things like that. But, but, but I love it. I, do you I, get stuff in the grocery store too? Yes. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yes, constantly. <laughs> and they, they, they have the benefit of, you know, they say, oh, hey, doc, how are you doing? I, I, I can remember their pets' names used in, a, in their own, the owner's names. You know, it reminds me of, and I follow politics closely, and with Tom Perriello, Tom Perriello is, was a fantastic, fantastic guy from our area. And one of the things that he had going for him was the Perriello name. And the Perriello family for so long and still does has treated so many people from a medicine standpoint. And because of that, they had such a positive tie to the community, very much like you, Dr. Wood, and that like almost like a doctor who delivers babies. When <laughs> someone is delivering your baby and bringing you into this world, you are going to have an, uh, a lasting, lifelong relationship with that man or woman. Right. Because you have done something incredibly positive for this family. Same with you. You know, whether it's like me with the German Shepherd, with my German Shepherd, Max was running in our backyard, and he hit a stick, and he had an entire skin ripped off leg. his leg. Yeah. And then they had to take the skin from his belly yep. and put it on his leg. Yep. Um, I, it's the relationships that I'll never forget. Talk to me about the relationships, how much they mean to you, and maybe put it in perspective perhaps with a story where you've mm. treated an animal years ago and still to this day, you have that connection with this particular patient and their family. Well, I have lots of stories like that, but the, the interesting thing is that um, the, the, the people, it's so rewarding when I saw clients that were in their 30s and then they have kids and then the kids grow up and the kids start coming to the vet with them with their mm -hmm. pets and then they go up, they have families of their own, and they bring their own pets back. It's such a reward. So, it, you know, That's it makes awesome. me feel so great that they're, they're willing to, to continue onward. And, and you remember these little kids when they come in, the next thing you know, they get bigger and bigger. And, and then it's just, it's, it's very exciting to be able to just to just to do that part of the whole scenario. How about same with your business? Talk to us about oh that. Oh my gosh, I still have people coming in that remember my big brand dog Ernie. Then people that don't even have a dog, and they come they come back to see if the big brown dog's still there, and you know visit, and they bring you know they bring people from out of town, and it's it's just so nice, you know, when they remember those things. When they come back into town, they've been away for a long time. They just come back to say hi. That's you know you gotta love that kind of thing. That's what. One thing that makes Charlottesville so great is it's small enough so you can remember uh, business people that make a difference and people that you remember, and it's, it's, it's not so big and it's not so little. Everyone's you know? a yep. few degrees apart in Charlottesville and certainly across exactly. Central Virginia as well. Mm -hmm. Tough aspects of your job. And I've got to think one of the tough aspects, and I just went through this myself, is you know, euthanasia. Euthanasia. Youth for sure. Um, um, you know, for the, for, the, for, the, for the pet owner, for, for the, the you know, my, 
it's, it's certainly uh, perhaps more emotionally difficult than for someone than your position who you know is doing perhaps a lot of these but still I've got to think that you know it's like a therapist you know when a therapist is seeing someone over and over and over again a bunch of people from a different bunch of different walks of life yes they're able to compartmentalize it yes. but at the same time they can't help but taking some of it home with them well it, it's one of the hardest things we do because people a lot of times grieve more over a pet than they even do mm -hmm. members, you know, close members and things like that. And one of the reasons is because when you get to that stage and you feel so helpless as they're getting older and older and what can I do and are they in pain, are they doing these things like that? And then you, you basically say, I know it's time. I, 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 I feel like I'm doing a disservice if I, if I let them go on because they're not doing well. But then you feel like I'm God and I have to make that decision. I have yeah, to do that's it. That's what I struggled with. So it's very hard to do, but what I tell people all the time is the last gift that we can give to an animal is when it's time, it's time. And if you come to us, we as veterinarians will say, yes, you're right, it's time, or no, it's not. You know, or no, here are some alternatives. And so therefore, mm -hmm. um, we, and hopefully we, we've, we've been, had a chance to way ahead of time say, uh, there are other things maybe we can, we can do if you want to do them. Sometimes people don't want to do them, but a lot of times they, they, they do want to do them. What's made a big difference, in my opinion, is this, once you think about the fact that, well, gosh, it's time to put Fifi to sleep, you've got to pick up the phone and call me. Then you've got to bring Fifi in. Whereas if I come to your house to do it, right. it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I should have done that. Well, and then again, it's one of these things that some people want to do and some yes people and don't no. want to do. There, yeah, there's a yes and yes no and to no. it. There, there are some people who basically would much prefer just to come on in, and other people are like, well, if I come over to your house, then it makes more sense. And so it's, it's a tough decision all around. Why and do you say yes and no? Wow. Well, it, it, you know, just people do deal with this differently. I mean, sometimes it's when they're having trouble maybe accepting it and or don't want to watch what's going on, sometimes it's better to just say goodbye and walk away and remember how you saw your animal the last time. And then there's some people that want to just be right there till the you know the very last breath. You know, it's that's the yes that's how and I no. Felt. I agree hundred percent. Right. 100%. right. That, 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 as like like Patty said, there's there's mm -hmm. people who it's a lot easier to remember them. You come into the office, right. you basically say, hi, how are you doing? And I, I, I know it's time, we've already talked about it, the whole thing, we'll take care of everything. You, you just right. basically sign, sign a piece of paper saying you give us permission and, and you can leave. And a lot of times that's what you wanna remember. And there, but there are the, the other side of the coin where people basically say, you know, like, like I said, I wanna be there to the very, Endpoint. So it's uh, all different. Sharon in Charleston, South Carolina is watching. And Sharon in Charleston says, um, knowing when to let go, doctor, uh, with euthanasia. Is it no longer eating, no longer walking, pottying on their own, having accidents in the house? What are the indicators we're looking for? Well, that, that's a really good question because there's no one distinct answer except for the fact that you can usually tell like flipping on a light switch. You can tell by the look in their eye that if you get up in the morning and your little doggy, your little kitty cat doesn't want to get up and go to the food bowl to eat and you take the food bowl to That's them. What I knew. She wasn't eating raw meat. Right. I, she was, the dry kibble was too hard on her teeth. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to do whatever thing. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to play God. Selfishly, I wanted her to pass in the sleep, in her sleep. We all want that. I didn't want even to have personally. the decision. Yeah, yes. I did not want to make the decision. And that right. says more about me than the animal. No, not at all. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the way we all, we all want to be. So in that scenario, if you follow a step further, as you did, you, you go to the cabinet, you basically offer them the ultimate thing. You op open a can of tuna fish for a cat, open a can of chicken for a cat, you, uh, you get a steak out for a dog mm -hmm. or anything like that, and you take it to them. And if they basically say, I'm still not interested, then that's a, that's a major light bulb. At the same time, if the dog can't get up and can't walk and things like that, that adds to it because you know, you, you've eliminated that because of the fact that if you bring them food, but if they basically say, I'm not interested in eating and I'm just laying there and the whole thing, it's time to look at alternatives. Now maybe they're just in pain and if they're, they're in pain and the veterinarian gives them some pain medication mm -hmm. because who knows, and that's one of the frustrating things is that the dog could be laying there and you and I have, you know, our knees hurt, our back hurts, whatever, and, and we can consciously go take a leave or aspirin or Tylenol or whatever, 
but a dog, you can't tell, and especially as it's a slow, gradual thing, that they're getting more and more uncomfortable. There's so many animals that we give them a, a trial dose of Remedil, a pain medication, and the next thing you know, oh Goes my a gosh, lot of yeah, they've got, they're, they're, they're a new dog. But if you do something like that and they're not a new dog and they're not eating, it's, it's time to think of alternatives. I'll tell you something that's kind of funny that'll bring a little levity to this. So Ernie, you know, was not eating and just going on through the whole weekend. And I was like, oh man, I know what I got to do on Monday. And so we're having dinner and I decided, well, we'll have something special. You know, we'll try to make, cheer ourselves up and make us feel a little better. So we're gonna have jumbo lump crab cakes. Nice. Oh, I mean, the my. really nice crab cakes. That dog was on it. He was sitting on me. He, would, he was ready to jump in my lap. And I just looked at him. Two jumbo lump crab cakes. We're talking $40 worth of crab here for two of them. And I just looked at him and said, here, you might, might as well have it. And then the, uh, the guy I was having dinner with said, well, you might as well have mine too. So that dog ate really well on this last night. You know, it's a Chesapeake. He wanted crab, yeah. you know, whatever. But, you know, that's what I remember. It's like, daggone it. He had a fine dinner that night. You know, he probably would have had a beer, too, if I'd given it to him. You know? <laughs> let, let me, when, I, when I started seeing it was um, the back legs were not working. Um, the diet, the, the, uh, the appetite for food that any dog would want was not there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know. It's a tough, a tough decision because um, you, you want to do what's best for uh, uh, the old girl that's been with you for 17 years. Yes. But what you do is you, you eliminate the things that maybe are causing the problem. So if they have teeth problems, if... We did that. Okay. If they have, because like you and I, our taste buds don't work as well as we're older. Mm -hmm. So you have to, like, go to go to Patty and get some more specialized food. Get something that's a more flavorful food for them to eat. So you eliminate that and, and, the, and the whole lameness thing. Are they lame because... They're lazy, are they overweight, are they lame because they have something wrong, their knees are bad, their hips are bad, or whatever, and you, you give them, and even cats. I mean, mm -hmm. you think of a cat, and you think about a kitten, and my, we have two cats that are now probably a year old, just past the kitten stage, who can easily jump on top of a dresser. Oh, yeah. But you think about your adult cat that's sitting at home right now that's seven years old. When was the last time it dropped on top of the dresser, jumped on top of the dresser? A lot of times they won't anymore. Well, they don't do it, we think, because they're just getting older and they don't want to do it anymore. But sometimes it's a matter they're uncomfortable. They have arthritis and pain, too. So you give them a little pain medication, all of a sudden the owner calls and says, guess what? They're up on the dresser again. Yeah. So you mentioned, again. you mentioned funny, not really funny stories, but... but uh, it goes along with this whole thing. I had a client that had a, um, a coon hound, a black and tan coon hound, and the dog basically was a, was a hypothyroid dog. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And hypothyroid mm -hmm. means that the thyroid level was too low. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so the dog lived in a neighborhood, and because he was a hypothyroid dog and he was very sluggish, he laid on the front porch. And so they brought the dog in, and the dog kept getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, and we did a blood level on him, and sure enough, he's too low. We put him on thyroid medication. So we put him on thyroid medication, and the next thing you know, the dog is up and running around the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, he was too close to the road. Oh, no. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't have him in a fenced yard because they didn't need to have him in a fenced oh, yard. Oh, my gosh. So he went back to his old behavior, and, sure. and we saw him for orthopedic problems <sighs> after that. But, but it's interesting how, you know, you, you get so complacent with the idea of, well, the cat can't jump up there because it's getting older, but really mm -hmm. it can't because of other problems. Anita in Crozet says, I have a five-year-old, and I want him to grow up with a dog like I did. When is it too soon for a little boy to get his pet? Five years old is plenty old enough. Yeah. But you need to get a bomb-proof dog. That's my opinion. <laughs> if, you want yeah. a, if you want a dog for a kid, go get yourself a Labrador Retriever type of dog. You can go to the SPCA. Yep. There's plenty of them, but get a lab cross dog. A Don't corgi's get a, not right for you. <laughs> no, it's not. And a German Shepherd. I love German Shepherds, but German Shepherd is not right for you. Uh, you want a dog that basically the dog that, that your son can, can jump on top of, can ride on, can bite his ear, can grow up together and have a good time. And you can even get an adult dog, so it doesn't have to be a puppy at this point. Point. But labs are, as a rule, are, I call them bomb proof. Mm -hmm. They'll put mm -hmm. up with a whole lot. And uh, that's what you want. You want a nice bonding relationship with something like that. Why, why, and, and jump in here too, why, why not the German Shepherd? Is it the 
Okay, my personal experience with the German Shepherd. Uh, German Shepherds constantly need to be stimulated. German Shepherds constantly want to be pleasing or doing something that is like uh, an activity. Uh, German Shepherds need probably more exercise than a lot of other dogs. Um, German Shepherds can be incredibly protective, especially of small animals, small uh, children in the family. Um, I had a UPS driver, or UPS delivery guy, for some reason the screen door was open. Uh, the screen door was closed, the door was open and he needed a signature. And for some reason, this particular individual chose to open the screen door mm -hmm. and oh check to see who was in the house to get that signature to drop off the package. And my 130 pound German Shepherd- Said, I'll sign this. <laughs> leaped and knocked yes. him down on the front deck yes. and just stood over looking at him. Yeah. And the UPS driver was terrified. Whoops. Oh, I'm and sure, I would be too. Literally said to me, he goes, I won't say anything if you don't say anything, because yeah. he knew he had done something wrong. And yeah. I responded to him, I said, you yeah. came in my house. Yeah, of course. of course. My dog was doing what he was supposed yeah. to be doing. Talk to me about the German Shepherd and why the German Shepherd is not necessarily a bomb-proof dog for a five-year-old. Well, you just answered all the questions. You made it easy for me. Uh, <laughs> they're basically a, a working breed of dog, that's the class that they're in, mm -hmm. where, whereas a, a lab is a hunting dog, and, and the labs nowadays come in two flavors. They come in the, in the real hunting ones, whereas the ones that we, you and I see all the time, if you, if you send them out there to basically track birds or whatever, they go, oh, right. there's a cute little bird flying right. around. <laughs> right. They do this thing. Yeah. So <laughs> German Shepherds are very pleasing animals. They're very intelligent animals, but they need a job and they, they need to do something on a regular basis, and they're very protective, so they are pack-oriented. What we didn't get into earlier about the fact about the pack is that you are a member of the pack, your wife is a member, your kids are a member of the pack, and what should logically happen is, is and I, I know this is a sexist comment, but usually because we have deeper voices, the males in the family become the alpha dogs, the females in the family become the beta dogs, mm -hmm. and then the kids are further down, and then, then comes the dog. So as a result of this, in your per personal situation that you were just talking about, the dog was protecting the pack and somebody was entering the household. And so the, think of the same thing happening when your son's home alone with the German Shepherd, the next door neighbor comes over who is eight years old playing with your eight-year-old son, walks in the house, and the, the, the kid yeah. didn't mean anything mm -hmm. bad, but, he, he, but the dog said, somebody's attacking my, uh, my pack member. So that's why they're not as good, and I know German Shepherd breeders would basically say, oh, I'm wrong, but in terms of overall, I love German Shepherds. That's the first dog I ever wanted to get was a German Shepherd. I love them as a breed, mm -hmm. but they're not the go-to dog for the a young kid, for a five-year-old okay. kid. Yeah. Good example. Yeah. Jump in here, Patty. And, and labs, you know, just the, the size and shape of a lab. They're big and goofy and sturdy. I mean, a kid can love all over them and flop around on them. They're not going to sit on or ride them, but, you know, it, just because of the way they're just a big, sturdy dog. And they like hanging out, and they like being, you know, sitting on around and watching TV and having popcorn and whatever, you know, they're just, they're just goofy, easy to be around dogs. I mean, you can't, there's nothing a lab doesn't like. So yeah, when you, yeah. what kind of, what kind of situation do you think is best for those working dogs, the working breed dogs? Hmm. Well, they, they, more they, land, more time to spend with yes. them. Well, see, I have an Australian Shepherd. Okay. Australian uh, Shepherds are brilliant dogs. you have dogs. a farm. You have a farm, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Australian Shepherds are the second smartest breed of dog, number one being the Border Collie. But if you came to me and said, I'm thinking about getting an Australian Shepherd, I would say you need the, they, the dogs need a job. Right. You, if you don't give them a job to do, and you, you, if you live in an apartment, if you live in a townhouse, and you come home every day, and the dog stays in the house every day, and you don't do anything but take him for a little walk or something, you're going to come to me and go, I don't understand it. My dog is destroying my couch. He's destroying my carpet. And he, he's wetting on things, and he's doing all these misbehavior mm -hmm. because that's not the environment for him. You put him in a herd of sheep. You put him in something like that. He, he's in his natural environment. So therefore, my dog is a Frisbee dog. And my dog, basically, every day when I come home, has to go for a long walk. I have to throw the stick. When I go up and feed the horses, what I have throw to do the with stick. Mine. Yes. And if you don't do that, and then, it, then I sit down on the couch, and I have to throw a, a treat. Right. Not a treat, but I have to throw <laughs> a, he has a lobster. Yeah, yeah. constantly. Oh, where are you at? Yeah, and I have to sit on the right-hand side of the couch because my wife's on mm -hmm. the left-hand side, so I don't throw it over her. Because she always says, well, don't throw that over me. 
Uh, so it, <laughs> take turns. And that's the thing. Yeah. So yeah. you don't want an Australian Shepherd for that, that household either, unless you live on a farm and you, uh, or, and you have things that you're going to do for them. I can say, Merlin, go get the horses. And he can go, they're going to be in the back pasture, and he'll basically run out there and bark, 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 <coughs> and chase them up <clears throat> to the front of the fence. I got a question for both of you. This comes from Sharon. Um, what are the distinguishing characteristics of the different labs, especially, say, uh, a Chesapeake versus a Golden? Well, you know. Wow. Well, my experience with Chesapeake, uh, uh, you know, a lab, ah, gosh, a lab, you can ask it to do something, and he's like, okay, you know, he'll, he'll do it. A Chesapeake is intense. They want to know what you want to do, am I doing it right, am I going to do all the same time, same things simultaneously together and just, they're on, they're, they're ready. Uh, a golden retriever, uh, you know, it depends on how they're bred. I mean, the, the golden retrievers can be either really, really sane or really just, woo, you know, just kind of out of there. I mean, and, uh, most of the pet ones, you know, there there's, doesn't seem to be a whole lot of in between, at least the ones that we've seen. Uh, you know, and then you have your grooming involved. I mean, labs are easy. Uh, Chesapeake's are easy. Uh, golden retrievers, you've, you've got grooming. You better have your brushes and combs and your little snippers to keep their feet you know, tidy. You know, there's a lot more work with the golden. So, Dr. Wood, your thoughts? Yeah. Well, my mm. major thought, and I totally agree with everything she's saying, <laughs> is there's a difference in coat color personality between a chocolate lab definitely a black lab and a yellow lab absolutely chocolate labs get up every morning and have a cup of cappuccino for breakfast so <laughs> they are a, a dog on caffeine on steroids they come in oh and, and when they come in and they're two years old the owners would say when are they going to stop being wild and crazy and they're nice dogs but they're 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 like they're they're, they're, they're like, on they're on when they come in, when they're eight years old, they're on. They, they never slow down until they get to be 12 years old, and the next thing you know, they've slowed down. But basically, the whole life. So if you buy yourself a chocolate lab, then you can <coughs> anticipate you're going to have a dog who's a very hyperactive dog. They're wonderful dogs, but they're, they're, they're just, it's, it's wired into the coat color. The only thing I can figure, because black labs don't do that. The other interesting thing about labs is, I tell everybody this, that for two years... They are the worst chewers in the world. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't lose a pair of shoes, a piece of molding, a door, a carpet. You're lucky. You're lucky. And, and what you need to do is you need to go to Patty and you need to buy. There aren't enough bully sticks in the world right. for that age You group, need to buy though. 50 <laughs> toys and sit them around your house, and yep. all, especially near your furniture and things. And every time the dog goes over there, give them something like that. Stick that in their mouth then you'll be fine. But if you don't, and don't make the stupid thing of like, I have an old pair of tennis shoes, so let him chew on that. Oh, they no. don't know the difference between a tennis shoe and, and your good pair of Manolos. Whatever. I love this conversation <laughs> here. How about this? And I'm speaking from firsthand experience with the Germans. How about the difference in characteristics between the black German Shepherd and maybe like a, a black and tan or a saddleback? From what I've seen, my all black German Shepherd, both purebreds, both same breeders, same mom and dads, six months apart, six months apart, different litters. Yeah. Okay, the black German Shepherd is bigger. Right. The black German Shepherd is more protective. Yep. The black German Shepherd is more courageous. Yep. The, the uh, black and tan is 25 pounds smaller. Mm -hmm. Looks like Rin Tin Tin. Right. Um, he is not nearly as courageous or as alpha or as outgoing. Perhaps it's because he's smaller than his brother. Right. Um, and also people are much less intimidated with the Rin Tin Tin looking than the all black one because he is an all black looking dog and he looks scary. Yes. Maybe the all black hmm. looking dog is picking up on the vibe that the people are letting out and that's why he responds in this way and the Rin Tin Tin is not getting those vibes and maybe that's why he's more laid back. You're the expert. Your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree with you 100%. It's, it's a, a lot of, you've got genotype and you've got phenotype. So genotype is basically what you're born with genetics. Mm -hmm. Phenotype has to do with what, how you respond to the environment. So it has to be, you know, why you as the number one son versus your sister, why did you turn out the way you turned out in the environment? Some of it's gen genotype, but some of it's phenotype. So it's the same thing with the dogs. You have a big dog, you have a dog who basically growled one time, and because he was bigger and a little bit more um, sure of himself, basically projected that to you, and, and so therefore you learn to basically, okay, well, I won't push you as much. And so therefore the dog is a, is a more- Interesting. More- Nature uh, versus nurture. Yes. Oh boy. You hit the nail on the head. Interesting, jump in here, Patty. 
Uh, with the colors? Anything oh. at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a white German Shepherd. She was kind of a princess. I mean, I, 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 I got nothing on that one. <laughs> um, you know what I like about it is um, I, I, I like about it in that Leo, the black German Shepherd, and I think you're totally right. He was bigger, and, we, and when he was, you know, showing his alpha characteristics, his brother wasn't around there quite yet because he's six months younger, mm -hmm. and Leo was like, okay, I can be this way. And then Max, he was in a wolf pack that already had two other members in it, and he was less able to show those alpha characteristics, yep. and as a result, a little bit more mellow, because had he has shown those alpha characteristics, the two other dogs in the pack would have put him down. Yeah. Interesting thing. People bring in these oversized dogs, the, a Labrador Retriever, that it basically is supposed to weigh 60 pounds. This one is not fat, but he, he is taller than normal and bigger Big than boys. normal. Invariably, you know what they say, the first thing they say to me? He was a run of the litter. No kidding. So what happens is you have a whole litter of puppies, that eight puppies, seven puppies, whatever. The run of the litter gets the smallest amount of food. He gets the, 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 the last breast, the smallest one, the, the, the least, or the last one to eat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Once they get out of that situation, they sometimes have to make up for it. And, and, and people invariably say that. They go, you will not believe this, but this was the run of the litter. <laughs> it happens all the time. So they, they overcompensate. Because they feel once, bad. Well, because they finally have access to food, and they're like, I'm never going to go back again. The I same thing it. happens to stray animals. Oh, yeah, you rescue get, dogs are yeah. really bad about that. Yeah, they, they, well, they not get bad, but that's what happens. Right? Rob, yeah. Rob Lawson, will, and guys, well, mm. we got an hour in. Wow, this hour went fast. Rob Lawson, one of the last questions we have for you, and we'll get Patty's perspective here. We'll throw it to you. Guys, when do we uh, feel welcoming introducing a second dog to a one-dog family? When we start with you and then get your take on that. Whoa. Well, I mean, there's so many things to consider. I mean, you have to consider what your relationship is with the dog that you have now, your time, your schedule. I mean, do you really have enough time for two dogs? He has an uh, eight-year-old Labrador. <clears throat> well, I mean, you just you have to look and see what your, your schedule is like and whether you can manage it. You know, there's time and budget around. Um, there are some that do well with a buddy. Uh, my Chesapeake, when he was left on his own from my Irish Wolfhound and my white German Shepherd, you know, I kind of connected with him and say, well, I just got a feeling that he he liked that one-on-one -on -one with me. And it's sort of a feeling that you get, really. What, uh, what do you think, Dr. Mm -hmm. Wood? Well, I commonly get this question <clears throat> related to the fact that, especially at eight years of age, you're thinking about the dog's, the dog's passing. The dog's mortality. Yeah, especially only a the, lab. Especially a lab, yeah. exactly. And what I tell people is, is that it, it, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and get a, a younger dog and mm -hmm. introduce them to this younger dog. And, and I, you'll have a lot of benefit. One of the major benefits is you'll notice that all of a sudden that dog will wake up and start doing more things. So that eight-year-old dog will now end up being like a five- or six-year-old dog. I saw that with mine. Happens all the time. It youngified my Lucy. It youngifies him, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that puppy will go over there and chew on his ear and pull on him and the whole thing, and the first couple of times he's going to go, leave me alone. And then pretty soon he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna embellish that. He's going to love that. And he's going he's gonna to be more active. He'll lose a little bit of weight because he has to move around more. And he'll, he'll be, you know, they're pack oriented. He, he probably, so I, I can't think enough about doing it. The other thing it does is it gives you a buffer. So when that dog becomes nine or ten years old, and now he's two years old, for instance, if you get a, get a puppy, but if you get an adult dog, whatever the age it is, then it, it helps with that transition too. Well, so at eight years old, the mm -hmm. average lifespan for a lab is probably going to be 12 to 15 years. And when I see them at 12, I see very commonly at 12, of course less at 13, 14, and um, you know, 15 is, is very, very old for a lab. We do see them, yeah. but very old. Anything you else want to add here, Patty Bowden? Uh, no, but before, uh, if we are getting close, I, I want to talk about events that Companion Animal Fund is having. Yes. Like the Howl and Growl Pub Prowl. Yeah, two weeks from Saturday. That's right. And yes. then there's, there's a, sp a spring dog wash yes. that you always have. For you sure. want to talk about your events? So we've been very fortunate, as, <laughs> as we talked earlier in the show, uh, 
Companion Animal Fund is a 501c3. 100% of the money that we raise goes to help the animals. We, anything that happens in terms of secretarial things, posting things, we all pay for it out of our own pocket because mm -hmm. we want all that money to go strictly for that. So our big fundraiser of the year is How and Growl. It's happening March 23rd. It's it, so fun. It's, it's great. It's a limited number of people. We end up having like 70 people. We go mm -hmm. to four different locations. This year we're going to Fellini's. Mm -hmm. We're going to Violet Crown. We're... Uh, the um, the place right on the corner here that that does the beer um, draft tap room mm -hmm. tap room yeah love that place um, and the nook <laughs> and the nook yeah and my wife's restaurant so what happens is you you go to each place you get uh, uh, sample their food you mm -hmm. get a class of beer or, or wine and then you go to the next place sample their food and keep on going like that and it's then a progressive it's progressive I love it that's yeah. a great idea yeah. and there's opportunities there's there's auction items that are going to be yes. I personally put together the big gift basket today. Oh, it's a so, huge thing. Yeah. It always goes, it always yep. makes a whole lot of money, and we yep. have all kinds of wonderful gifts and things from Wintergreen and different places in town. And yeah. So we, we raised somewhere between sixteen and eighteen thousand dollars. Good for you. In that four hours, which most of it comes from sponsorship and nice people like like Patty that That's donate awesome. money. And there's you can find things. out about it from the Companion Animal website and right. your website. And Animal Connection org. has it on our events page. Fantastic. And so you can sign up and, and get tickets. It's coming on March twenty third. Third, yep, Saturday, Saturday. Night. So that's, five that's coming pretty Fellini's. soon. It's fifty dollars or thirty dollars mm -hmm. if you're you you know the designated driver. Yeah, for four and restaurants you can't beat it. Yeah, I'll tell you what. If you give uh, your contact information to JW over there, we'll put it in front of a uh, quarter million people on our website. There you go. Yeah, Fantastic. send. That's just good. give it to him. We'll <laughs> yeah. get your information and we'll get the word out there. Anything else on your brain there, Patty Bowden? And then you have the dog wash coming in the spring, yes. and that's always at the Old Dominion yes. parking lot. It and there is. We do it on And all of your staff participates in. That, that's, that's a big day. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, I did that when I was in, in vet school as a fundraiser there. And, you know, everybody gets out there, including our kids that are there washing dogs. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a great event. Sometimes we have different people showing different. Uh, we had some police officers there before mm -hmm. showing some, uh, some working dogs and how mm -hmm. they, they get people out of cars and things like that that don't want to come out. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's very interesting. Sometimes it'd be nice to talk about Coffee Wood. Yeah, Coffee Wood. Coffee Wood is a, is a correctional institute down in um, um, uh, Farmville. Okay. And we do their dogs down there. Cool. And that's a, it's really interesting. They're can they're, what kind of dogs? Well, they, it's interesting because they have three kind of dogs they bring in. Okay. They have um, dogs that are, are search and seizure dogs. Uh-huh. They have um, cell extraction dogs. Okay. And they have um, cell phone dogs. Dogs wow. that sniff out cell phones? Yes. Get out of town. How do they even do that? Well, <laughs> it was interesting because we see them, and they, they typically the people come in, they, and they look like they, they have camo on, uh -huh. and they, look, they bring in Rottweilers. And okay. Rottweilers, you know, are going to be cell extraction dogs. Sure. And what they do is these, these big guys that are down there, they say, you need to come out because we, we need to talk to you or whatever. I'm not coming out. Of course. They come out as soon as they see that Rottweiler. Sure. So oh, then they bring wow. in the bloodhounds, or sometimes their labs or whatever, and of course they're search and seizure dogs. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. The they, cell phone one doesn't right. make sense to me. So they, they, they bring in this little dog that obviously couldn't do any one of these two things, and I said, what does this dog do? And they said, it's a cell phone dog. If you've had a cell phone in your pocket in the last week, the dogs can know that. The, 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 the people, the inmates are not allowed to have cell phones. Sure. Holy and I smokes. said, can you show that to me and he goes i would love to but i'm sure all your employees have had cell phones in their pocket and so therefore everybody's going to come up positive of course but if you took a whole room full of people never had a cell phone in their pocket for their day put one cell phone in there sat them in a crowd the dog would walk up there and sit down what is the dog's what is the dog Whoa, they, this is going to be a whole other show it's, it's <laughs> electronics they it's can, the they electronics can, yeah it, <clears> it's just amazing and you think about oh. they're, they're, they're sniffing cancer in uh -huh. people nowadays well yeah i didn't know about that yeah but diabetes the cell phone just yeah. really, everything really, really mm. amazed me that they could do that because because they can do drugs of course they can smell sure. marijuana and, and never all different heard things of the cell phone but the cell I phone was either. really neat i thought it was a really Really cool thing. We should. We should That's be get a whole you back. Other that show. is another topic. Yep. We should so, do that. So what they do is they, they as they walk them in from the yard, uh -huh. the dog is standing there. Oh and, my gosh! Uh, if the dog sits down, they say you, you need to come over here. He, they, they know the dog uh -oh. has a cell phone there or has it in his uh, in his I cell. Didn't know that. 
I Isn't it amazing? Patty, Lo- dogs are amazing. They dogs are amazing. Are amazing. I, love dogs. I like dogs more than people. Yay, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and cats, too. I love cats, too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm a dog guy. <laughs> uh, you killed it. Thank you. Well, it's fun. I it was fun. Yeah. You. You did, uh, we did uh, an hour and five minutes. It felt fun. like 15 minutes. Yeah. Patty Bowden, thank you for setting this up. This is uh, fun. Yeah. Uh, guys, this is Dr. Chuck Wood, the owner of Old Dominion Animal Hospital and the founder of Companion Animal Fun. Um, check out their website for a lot of fantastic events that are around the corner. Exactly. You can also go to Animal Connections mm-hmm. Facebook page and learn about this. We're going to feature them on I Love Seville as well. Yeah. Um, I am mm-hmm. grateful for Harris Tolber, our director, Judah Wickhauer, and Lauren Linsky, producers of this program. My name is uh, Jerry Miller. She is Patty Bowden. He is Dr. Hello. Wood. This is uh, What's Barking Local on the I Love Seville Network. Yay. Thank Bark you. local. Work. Good work. <laughs> yeah. go, uh, go dogs. Yeah, Georgia go dogs. Bulldogs. <laughs> dogs. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You did great, Dr. Wood. It was fun. Did, did we have yeah. to sing Glory, Glory, Georgia? Mm-hmm.